Global Coaching Life, a podcast to tell the stories of some of Australia's great men and women's coaches. Today we're, we're honoured to have John Cosmina as our guest. Um, John has got a remarkable history in Australian football. Um, debuted for the Socceroos age 20, played over 100 games for the Socceroos, 64 caps, uh, scored um, tw- 25 goals in his caps and 42 goals for Australia overall. Almost 300 games in the NSL and, and goals to match all that. Has coached in the MPL, has coached in the A-League and, and won a minor premiership at Adelaide. Uh, also been an assistant coach with the Socceroos. And from time to time we see his ugly mug on TV as well. He's done it all. Welcome, John Cosmina. Thanks, Gary. Good to talk to you, mate. You're looking well. <laughs> you too, mate. We've been around the block. We're 60... But, but, oh, sorry. Um, We'll both be 65 this year. That's right. Yeah, it's dead right, mate. I remember back in 1982, we shared a room in the Lion Cup. <laughs> we did. In Singapore. We, we did. A good yeah, and, and, good old days. and won a gold medal as well. Yep. Yeah, I think we've forgotten about that. John, uh, this is about your coaching journey, not not really about your playing journey, but I thought um, overnight we obviously learned, of the, sadly, the passing of Frank Arrock. Um, I never really knew Frank as a um, as a player. My my time in the Socceroos has sort of come to an end as he was coming in, but I had the honour of being an assistant coach to him with the Socceroos in 1989 through that World Cup qualifying period. But I know you knew Frank really well as a player. Obviously, a key part of of the attack through those times. Um, just a sad day for football in Australia. Yeah, it is because I mean we, everyone talks about characters and maybe the the lack of characters that maybe the older people and still involved in the game would reflect on. And, and Frank was one of those. He was different. He was very different. He unbelievable passion for the game, yeah. incredible passion for the game. And that's what actually drove the players. Tactically, he kept the game fairly simple. He just liked to get numbers behind the ball, as you probably would have realised, yeah. um, working with him. Um, but he, for me, he reinvigorated the Socceroo brand after a probably a, a, almost a decade in the wilderness, after we qualified for Germany in 74, everyone just thought it was fait accompli that we'd go on and make Argentina in 78. We're unlucky that we didn't. Jimmy Shoulder came in as a coach. Yeah. There was a whole lot of politics involved around that, uh, and that all fell apart. Um, so they brought in Rudy Guttendorf, and you were involved with the Socceroos at that stage, and, and Rudy was certainly a bit different, but... Um, <laughs> It did not work. Uh, you know that, and as well as I do. And it, um, you know, we'd fallen into almost disarray. Yeah. Um, I think that you know the, the investment then had been in the club system. The NSL had started up, and um, that's where the focus was. But the Socceroos were, you know, hardly sighted. No one knew who they were anymore. And Frank put them back in the in the spotlight, and he he reinstilled or reignited the fires of the old Socceroo ethos. You know, about yeah. just never give up and. Um, he, he loved he his... did that through having belief in players he... and giving players respect for for their abilities and allowing them to do make their own decisions on the park. He gave us a framework to work within, and we went out and did what we needed to do. Yeah, look, I I couldn't agree more. It, it wasn't complex tactic wise. It was it was about the belief, the passion in the shirt, and and he loved his mad dogs. He he, he loved his players to be nasty bastards. Essentially, that was the... well, that's what he used to say. He wanted yeah. us to be bastards, and that's you know, and the mad dogs thing. He was he led by example. <laughs> yeah. So Val Frank, um, you, you'll be sorely missed, mate. Anyway, let's move on to John Cosmina. So, so many of us know so much about your distinguished playing career, um, not so much about your coaching journey. So let's kick that off. How did you, did you jump into coaching? Did you grab it with two hands? Did you stumble into coaching? What, what was the beginnings? What did they look like? Look, I, um, I finished in the NSL in 89. Uh, it was the last season of winter football. And I probably would have tried to hang on another year if um, the club I was at, Arpia at the time, wanted to keep me. But they had a change of coach. Um, Manfred Schaefer came in and he probably wanted to work with different sorts of personalities than me. And I can understand that because I was a bit, I could be difficult at times or stubborn. And um, and I was 33, I think, from memory. Yeah. yeah. Going on 34. And um, time was catching up. I had a few had a really bad hip and had a few other niggles and uh, <laughs> going through a marriage breakup at the time as well, which <laughs> didn't help. Um, so I'd you know, be making up for a bit of lost time 
in terms of uh, the social scene at that stage. And um, so it was probably the right decision. But I didn't do anything for a couple of years in regard to trying to find coaching jobs. And what I did do was go to a couple of um, two years in a row, 1990, 1991. Ronnie Smith ran uh, the old level two and the old level three yep. at the AIS. They were the coaching badges at the time. And um, I went to both of those. And then I got a, thought, I'll have a crack at this. Where can I get a job? And I got a job coaching in what was, I guess, the equivalent of the NPL. I think it was called the New South Wales Premier League with yeah. the Manly Warringah Dolphins. And started out there in first season was 94. And so it wasn't like I jumped at it. Um, I was in between. I wasn't sure whether I really wanted to or I didn't. But um, I've sort of got this saying, and it's almost creates a bit of bad karma when I'm saying it, but um, it, like coaching's not really working for a living because you love football. <laughs> It's not a real job, if you know what I mean. It's a, yeah. it's a different type of job. Yeah. And I think people that are in it actually know what I mean by saying that. Yeah, it's not absolutely. like you've got to get up at 8 o'clock and put your white shirt and tie on and go and sit behind a desk all day long. It's, it's, it's not, for me, it's not, it's, it beats working for a living. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a mentality I've always had. Maynard G. Krabs, if you can remember, was one of my heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Cosy, I'm really interested because through our playing career, um, Ronnie Ronnie um, Smith uh, obviously came to Australia and he'd got a full uh, coaching badge. Jimmy Shoulder was a young coach that that gave you a debut as a, as a 20 year old in the Socceroos had a full FA coaching badge. Eric Worthington came to Australia to set up the Rothamans coaching scheme here. But you and I both played under coaches that could rant and rave a bit, could get us fit, were great at sprints and push ups and sit ups and cursing and slamming doors. Um, but for me, you know, the lights came on when I got to work with Jimmy and Ron and, and Eric because all of a sudden I understood that coaches could change behaviours uh, and that was sort of a light bulb moment for me. H- where was your light bulb moment for coaching? Probably or, when I actually started it. I yeah. started thinking about the game differently. I mean, I, I, I had a certain way of... I, I used to look at the whole game and I sort of my father used to hammer me about trying to read the game and I'm, you know when I'm like 10 years old I'm thinking well <laughs> you read a book you don't read a game of football but eventually it, it sort of sunk in um, and all the stuff that and you're right Jimmy Eric Worthington came in I think it was 73 maybe earlier to set up that Rothman stuff Jimmy got the gig in the end of 76 after um, the Russia series when yeah. a guy called Brian Green was in charge of the Socceroos uh, so Jimmy came in after that uh, for that World Cup campaign, and Jimmy was good. He did. He made me think about football differently. Eric gave me some clues about stuff as well that I hadn't actually been shown yeah. uh, as a youngster. Most of the stuff, and I went through the same system as you, mate. Coaches that were they could talk the leg off an iron pot, um, <laughs> and half of it <laughs> you had to decipher because all well, of my coaches were basically um, of ethnic or European origin, so it was, uh, it was broken English, but it was fun. Yeah, um, and they were they knew a lot about football. Like most of them, my coaches were great players in their own right. Um, that just transitioned into coaching because um, they came here to play and ended up having to um, get a job. Yeah. So, um, but most of the stuff we learned back then, you worked it out yourself. And I think that's sometimes what's missing now is that we try and teach the kids too much. I think you've got to try and point them in the right direction. And my so, well, I guess my light bulb moment was. Certainly with Ron Smith, because he was Jimmy Shoulders' assistant yeah. when I got in, in the Socceroos back in 76. And um, and they, they taught me a lot. Um, the changing behaviours thing, <laughs> I don't know if my behaviours ever changed. Um, <laughs> no, we're talking about the on-field ones, mate. So, no, I'm talking about that. Look, it's I, over time, I mean, there's been a lot of talk. But I, I was heavily influenced by the way that I was brought up. Um, and I took that into my coaching. Um, you know, like I... You know, I had a new one ripped out of me so many times when I was younger uh, and even older. Um, I remember one time there was a guy called Billy Birch uh, and I was playing for West Adelaide in the first season of the NSL and we had to sit down after a game. Uh, we'd been pumped by Sydney, what are they called? Um, they, were, they were Eastern Suburbs then, Hakoa. Yeah. Um, soon we become Sydney City and then sort of Sydney FC-ish. And, um, and Billy, I had a stinker, and Billy <laughs> gave me a, the biggest um, bait I'd ever had in my life. Um, it does make you think about it. So, I mean, you can call them light bulb moments. I tried not to, to carry that into my coaching, but I did. I was aggressive with players at times when I probably yeah. shouldn't have been. Um, so, I guess my biggest light bulb moment has been in the last two or three years. 
when I've actually had some time away from from coaching, certainly away from the A League. Um, look, you evolve as you go along. Things work in different environments, and you've got as a coach to adapt to those different environments and work out, you know, what's going to work and what's not going to work, and you know whether you can give a player a bake and whether you can't. And, yeah. You know, I mean, I think, and I still think, as much as I have changed and I guess softened a bit with age, um, I still think that you know sometimes you know you, you can put too much of an arm or too many arms around a player's shoulder. I've always sort of had this underlying belief if you have to to blow smoke up a player's backside to get him to perform every week, the one thing that's guaranteed is he's going to let you down one day. <laughs> yeah, no, I could, couldn't agree more. Cosy, do you think, was there a coach that coached you as a player or, or someone that you've learned from since you've been coaching that you would say had the most significance on you? It's a hard question, that one, because mm. look, my father... And he probably, and him and I argued a lot about football. We used to, you know, like he used to browbeat me. He was <laughs> heavily into the game, um, but he used to hammer me about, you know, I mean, I don't think he's dead now, but I don't know if I ever played a good game in his eyes, uh, which sort of drove me a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, but the one thing he did, and I still believe this now, is he actually instilled the fundamentals of the game in the meat, how to control the ball properly, how to, and the one thing was like, use both feet. Has to be used both feet. And he used to, you know, I used to go out in the backyard and just practice for hours, you know, banging a ball against the wall or, you know, games at 1v1 with my brother, using the trees as goals and things yeah. like that. But it was about get the technique right, get your technique right. And that taught me a lot of stuff that, that Ron Smith in particular, um, in his time at the AIS, used to talk about get your body position right to receive a ball, which yeah. you know about. Yeah. Um, all that stuff was drilled into me when I was really young. Um, yeah. So I think he probably had the, in terms of how I think now, it's, I've gone back right back to get your fundamentals right. You don't need step overs. If you can't trap a ball properly or control a ball properly with both feet and you can't move it with the inside of your foot or get your body in line with it, you can't see the line of flight and pick it up early and you can't pass a ball properly 10 metres, like 10 times in a row, you're not going to make it as a footballer. Yeah. Simple as that. And so I've gone back to that. But I think from coaching, um, Frank had an influence because he taught me about um, managing people. Mm -hmm. um, Eddie Thompson, um, who's also long passed away now, was yeah. um, Tom and I were great mates. And he taught me a lot about managing people as well. Tom was a great man manager, yeah. fantastic man manager. Um, you know, Smudge has been great because of the technical side of the game. The thing is, with Smithies, you know, you start a football conversation with him, you haven't got three days to fucking go without sleep. Yeah, you end up with blood coming out of your ears. Yeah, but it's it's those sorts of people, are they're the ones that really um, stick in my mind. Yeah. John, it, it's interesting. I've had uh, been doing this for a couple of weeks now and, and had some great conversations already. And, and you spoke about your, the arguments you had with your dad there. Um, and I think one of the things maybe that's gone from the game, maybe because social on social media, I'm right and you're wrong. And not only am I right and you're wrong, but you're an idiot because you don't think the same way as me. But, but back in the days that you're talking about there, one of the things that happened around football was you didn't have to play the same system. No one w was compelled to do that. And it was OK to think differently. It was okay to play differently because it was all about results. So we could have people could have conversations about the game, culturally talk about it, understand what it meant, and the only way that I could prove I was right wasn't to be nasty and obnoxious. It was about going out and, and having my team play that way and, and win games of football. And we seem to have lost that capacity to to talk about the game and, and disagree without being obnoxious to one another. Do you think that's well, a, a fair that's statement? A that's a fair point. And that's it's something that's come up in a lot of discussions I've had over the last few years. That we did talk about, and sometimes, you know, with a lot of the players that I grew up with, you would they could be quite robust discussions. Yeah. Um, especially over a few beers after the game, <laughs> and, and it you know there was there'd be finger pointing at times, but there'd be finger pointing on the pitch. Yeah. As well, you were held to account, and I think that's what's probably missing. A lot these days um social media holds people to account that's look whether you i personally i hate it i don't think it's i don't have twitter i don't have facebook um you know for me it's it's not part of my life yeah um but it is part of 
the current footballer's life. Yeah. And if you look at the way that football's become such a business, it's all about a player being a brand now. We weren't brands back when we played, mate. It, um, we were just players that wanted to play and win every week <laughs> and have a good time doing it. <laughs> but, uh, now, you know, what's a brand? Yeah. Now it's, it is about the brand and it's about social media and it's all this sort of thing. So that's where the, the whole thing players not having discussions about the game. Yeah. And this is where I've, I think I've, I've learned a lot in the past few years in terms of coaching is you've got to get the players to, to buy in to what you want them to do or what you'd like them to do. And you let them empower them, let them take responsibility, let them be accountable for a lot of the decisions that they make on the pitch. That they don't, I think we've gone through this era where they, you know, we've had this transition from what happened at the AIS when it was active and when it was shut down back in the earlier, in 2005, 2006, I was, something like that. Mm. Uh, and even that had evolved. The last four or five years weren't quite as effective as they, the previous 25 had been. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we've gone away from players having those discussions about the basics of the game. Coaches, we've educated coaches differently as well. So that has an impact on the sort of players that we're developing. And so coaches aren't even having discussions about the game. You know, I'd, Listen, football's now got a completely different language. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, you've got to go and re-educate yourself to, yeah. to learn coach speak, so to speak. Yeah. And it's it, it's it's unnecessary. All it's done is complicated it for me. It's, I'm a really simple guy, mate. It's like football's a simple game. The ball was 100 years ago. It was round and it's still round, surprisingly. Yeah. Everything else has changed. Uh, you're too but wise. The same things still apply. The physics of the game still apply. You've got to pass it a certain way you've got to address it a certain way you've got to feel it a certain way the consistency of the ball might change but the underlying physics the fundamentals of the game haven't and i think we've tried to overkill it with science almost speaking about brands you're listening to the football coaching life brought to you by football coaches australia and making media the podcast people i'm gary cole and today our guest is former socceroo and uh, a-league coach john cosmina Cosie, I love I love where we're going here. Um, what is coaching? It's education. It's it's now it's a life education. It's educating kids about life because we've actually now got a responsibility as coaches to to use sport um, to do the job that maybe our parents might have done in our younger years. You know. Teach the kids about, as I just said, be responsible, be accountable. Um, start looking after your teammates, all those sort of good moral things. You, you know, you've got to teach kids about values and stuff these days. You know, in our day, I think it was it was pretty much done and dusted the way everybody was brought up. Yeah. I think society, you know, has evolved so much. So part of coaching is about educating kids about life and looking at the correlation between the game and how they live their lives as well. Because if they've got good habits off the park, they're going to have decent habits on it as well. Yeah, I agree. As as that changed, how has your how has your coaching changed over the journey? Oh, like I said, mentioned earlier, just um, I've softened a little bit. Yeah. Um, I do. I do get a bit fanatical about getting things right. I'm a, I've probably got a bit of. Well, my wife says I've got OCD, <laughs> um, and I've, I've got no doubt I have it. <laughs> I've got to keep, you know, tick, 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 tick. Um, but like when we do a passing drill, it's it's really even last night at training, you know, with a bunch of young kids and we we're just getting to know them. And it was hard not to to pull them up and, and coach them yeah. about this is what you're doing wrong, but it's not the time to do it. I think you've got to do a lot more one-on-one stuff with kids now. And that's the one thing that I, I looked at the group dynamic more so than um, I guess the, the individual dynamic over the, the years. Yeah, and I think what's happened now is you've got to start spending time one on one with kids because I think they they've missed something in their their football education and they need that personal time, um, whether it be about the 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 emotional the character side of the game or about the the, the technical side yeah. of the game as well. Your a lot of your football education came through your dad and your brothers in your backyard, and that story has been told so often by particularly the golden generation because we hear that story so often. Um, but probably fair to say that there's not a lot of backyard, not, not a lot of that cultural football stuff, the skills, the techniques happen in backyards today. No, oh, well, a lot of kids don't have backyards to start with. <laughs> yeah. you know, most kids did when we were growing up. We play on, 
the other thing is street football. Then that's a excuse me, that's the sort of thing I was, I was sort of referring to. It's you know, I remember Steve Darby, who was a I guess the the, the director of coaching for the well, I think it was called the Australian Soccer Federation yeah. back in the second half of the nineties, and and Darbs brought in some stuff about street football, and it all yeah. of a sudden it disappeared. Uh, when he left, he went overseas, and uh, different management came in, and um, the whole thing went away from street football. And coaching started to become a lot more complex for reasons I was never too sure of. Apart from I think there were blokes there trying to justify their existence, uh, making it sound good. And I'd sort of stayed away from the system for a while, uh, yeah. like late nineties through to the uh, to about when the A League started, and then it you had. To, they actually live with qualifications because you never had that qualification when I coaching started coaching in the NSL. Yeah, um, yeah, no. Great because I've never been good at doing homework, um, <laughs> and I'm still not. Um, yeah, but so that all sort of disappeared. Then the Dutch came in and brought in the curriculum, and lo and behold, the last eighteen months, two years, people are talking about street football again. That's where yeah. you learn. Yeah, it's you know, and I've told this story to a few times. When I was a kid at school, and I went. I, Growing up in Adelaide, I lived in Port Adelaide, and, um, now the Port Power, and you know they're an Aussie. It's an Aussie rule stronghold. I yep. was a you know the wog kid playing wog ball, and but we got. I started messing around at lunchtime on the school oval, and we ended up with a whole bunch of kids that wanted to play football. And what we used to do at lunchtime, and we had people queuing up to get involved in this, we called it bin soccer, and we just put a bin in the middle of, of a footy oval, yep. and had one ball. And it was like survival of the fittest. And whoever could hit the bin won the game. <laughs> but it was bodies going left, right, and centre. But you know what? It was, actually, you fix your touch up, I can tell you. <laughs> and you learn how to survive. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Keep Keeping that education theme going on, did, have you had a coaching mentor on your journey? Have you had someone that you can trust in and, and talk through and bounce ideas off or anyone that uh, stood out? Not really. I'd, look, I ring Smudger every now and then. Um, we have good chat. If I've been in last time I was in Canberra, I had dinner with him, and yeah. um, it was great. You know, and he knew about the Reds as well, which he's very good at. <laughs> he is. <laughs> that's not Liverpool, and, that's not Liverpool either. No, he, no, he bought. He actually bought a nice one with him. Um, so I, I'll talk to Ronnie every now and then. Um, I'm still in touch with Steve Darby. You know, all yeah. via, via social media. Um, but apart from that, you just have your chat with with different coaches you come across along the way. Yeah. Um, I did the pro license in gee, what year was it? Two thousand nineteen. Yeah. Um, and that all went to went a bit pear shaped last year because nothing could be finished off. But um, working with other players and a lot of those guys are in the in the A League now. Like, oh, Michael Bridges is at um, coaching in Newcastle, for example. But Dave Drillich is in in um, America and. Uh, Robbie Stanton's assistant at, at Sydney FC. Um, where, you know, Popper came in, gave us a talk. There were a whole bunch of different coaches there. When you get coaches together um, that have actually played at a decent level, um, then I think you can have good conversations. I think a lot of the coaching stuff is, um, they just, it's, it's, it's about generating income and you go into a, a group of 50 people, coaches sitting in, a, in an auditorium, you don't get to have good conversations. Yeah. This was like 12 people. And we had great conversations about football. Yeah. Um, and that's what I think we need to get more of. We don't have enough conversations. And I, so I don't, I probably, you know, I've been meaning to ring Smudger for ages. Um, you know, I'll have a chat with Arnie every now and then about, and Arnie's had a great football education if you look at where he was as a player, but yeah. the coaches we've worked under, um, you know, certainly with the Socceroos, um, you know, with Hitting and Pimper Bake and um, even Bert Van Marwick, the last World Cup, you know, they've all got different things to offer. Yeah. Um, so you can have as long as I think you can get people. We don't have enough football conversations with enough people, um, but not you don't want the big groups. You don't want the auditoriums with a hundred people in it, where you know you can't even get a chance to ask a question. The yeah. more personalised stuffs where the problems really get solved, and that's for me it's like a dressing room. Yeah. You know, you've got a select group of people, and you talk football. Have you had that experience with with coaches from other sports outside of our game? Well, when I was up coaching in Brisbane years ago at the Brisbane Strikers, when they were the, well, long before the A-League started, I went and had a chat with Wayne Bennett. Um, and he gave me one really good piece of advice. That, well, actually two, and I've used it ever since. Um, he talked to me about when he had to get rid of Wally Lewis. You know, for the you know Victorians that don't know 
rugby league, although they might know a bit about it. Wally Lewis was a Queensland hero. Yeah. And he was at the Broncos and Benny was a coach. And um, he got, I asked him why he moved him on because it caused a lot of grief, caused him grief as a coach. Um, and he said, it's better one year too early than one year too late. <laughs> and I actually thought about that from when I was playing. And I, I thought if I'd have hung on another year, it would have been one year too late. Yeah. Um, and I've always used that. And the other thing was, if things aren't going right, if he'd said to me, if he'd had a bad trot with, um, you know, with, with matches and things weren't, games weren't going the way they wanted, he'd just give the guys some time off. Yeah. And I've used that. Um, coaching in the A-League, and it does work. You know, you have a bad run, um, go away for three or four days and think about the game. You're not going to lose any fitness in three days. Yeah. Um, you know, contrary to what a lot of people think, you don't have to train every day. Once you've got to achieve a certain level, sometimes you need a break from it because you get information overload and it just, it's not, the computer doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Then it jams up. It's like that, you know, on the max and that little thing that keeps just spinning around, around, <laughs> around. And that goes, the second of football That's my head. brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and that, they're the two bits that I've used and that was oh, that's 20 years ago yeah. there and um, when I was in Adelaide I did a little bit with Mark Williams um, spoke to him but not really you know sort of you come across guys every now and then and you talk about different things but it's, it's you don't get enough in depth it's, yeah. um, it's interesting now that there's a lot of cross code conversations yeah. now, I, when I did the pro license we went to Melbourne Storm yeah um, and for me, Craig Bellamy's got that down pat. The way he's got it set up there, incredible. Uh, great. Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't speak to him, um, but their whole system was great, um, and they were quite open. So there is this this cross code thing. I think a lot of Aussie rules terminology has been taken from football. Yeah, you think back to back in the eighties, and you think about it now, like they never used to have midfielders yeah. in Aussie rules, but they did in football. Yeah, uh, all that. There's a lot of a lot of talk about now. So the languages are starting to become similar because the, the science involved in all of the sports is is pretty much, you know, you can use it across all, all mediums. Yeah, Ernie Merrick, uh, we chatted with Ernie last week and, and obviously he and I worked together at, um, at Melbourne Victory, but Ernie's wife, Kerry, is a sister of Barry Richardson that played for Richmond and, and also worked uh, on the board at Geelong and Richmond as well. Um, Ernie knows a range of the, the, the AFL coaches and, and when we were working at Victory, um, there was always AFL, sorry, always. On regular occasions, AFL coaches would come and talk to us and, and want to look at training and, and want to study what we what we did. Um, and I think one of the things that AFL certainly changed, it, it more, much more focused on keeping possession of the ball and being prepared to play the ball backwards and sideways to try and get penetration in other areas. So I, th I think there's definitely opportunities for sports to work with one another and learn. Learning and wisdom yeah, from... Without being disrespectful of the other codes, I think they can actually learn more from us than we can learn from them. <laughs> One thing I love about Aussie rules blokes is that they're hard, though. Oh, yeah. They are hard. Like, I look at those, you know, news stories in the morning at, they're down at St Kilda Beach at 6 o'clock in the middle of a Melbourne winter, and they're in the water, and I'm thinking, <laughs> no, nah, our guys wouldn't do that. Our guys would be sitting in a spa bar. So tell me, Cosy, why do you do it? Why are you still coaching? Uh, I, I, I asked myself that question. I saw the stuff you sent me up last week, and that was one of the questions, and I still can't have thought about it. I still don't know why. It's, it's, I've, as, as I've got older, there was a time there when I was playing, and I used to think, why am I playing? But it was it satisfies something inside of me, and coaching's the same. And I actually, you know, I'm getting more joy out of coaching now than I did, I have done for a long time. Because yeah. I'm working with a different level of players. A League frustrated me for a, a while there. The first couple of years were great. When I went back to Adelaide United, Sydney FC, it was all a bit different. Um, the sport was a lot more because the, as the profile gets bigger, I think the politics become bigger as well. And I'm not a politician. And I'm, no. like I said, I'm a pretty simple bloke. Um, for me, it's black and white. There's no <laughs> shades of grey. And like compromise, it's like, well, in a compromise situation, someone always loses, don't they? Someone's got to give. <laughs> and I don't like to compromise, so I don't play politics. So the reason I, I what I do now is I do, because it's in my blood. Yeah. I talked about Frank's passion. My passion, the fire still sort of burns. Some days it's, you know, just a just a pilot light, and other days it's, it's a raging inferno. Yeah. I still get that buzz. I still get, 
you know, and you've sat on the bench as a coach, or you sat on the bench even as a as a manager at Melbourne Victory, and the ball comes in. Sometimes you get that little flinch <laughs> where you just want to get up and where you want to stick your head in there. And you know what I'm talking about. I don't do. You? I and do. I still got that. I, I still feel that now. I still want to have a kick of a ball and yeah. and you know do that sort of stuff and explain things to why things happen in football. I can pick a. I can sit on the bench and tell someone to shift their position on a set piece because I could work out where the ball's going to bounce, yeah. where it's going to land. And the amount of times I've had guys next to me say, how would you know that? <laughs> it's it's back to my man teaching me about reading the game. But it's that sort of stuff I get a buzz out of. It's a yeah. challenge. You're listening to The Football Coaching Life, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and making media the podcast people. We're honoured today to have a great Australian footballer, player and coach, John Cosmina, with us. Cosie, um, you obviously had times at, at Adelaide and Sydney FC, uh, and we all know as coaches, once we've been around the block a time or two, that the day we start, we're a day closer to, to finishing up and being sacked or resigning or moving on. Um, you were hard as nails as a player, always. Do you, how important do you think it is to be resilient as a coach to get through yeah, those times? Because, I mean, you said it in your intro, mate, it's... There's pretty much one thing that's guaranteed as a coach, that sooner or later you're going to get a kick up the backside, you're out the door. Um, not many coaches get to walk out on their own terms. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It, um, more often than not, a coach will get sacked. I mean, Mourinho's made a career out of it. He, <laughs> he's sacked that man United and gets 32 million euros. It's like, <laughs> why can't I get a job like that? <laughs> and he, he keeps bouncing back. So you, you have to be resilient as a coach. Because you're going to get slaughtered. If things aren't going right, it's the coach's fault. If yeah. things are going well, then you've got a great team. Yeah. It's that, so you you know, you know, have to be able to be resilient. You've got to be able to, to get yourself back up and get on your feet and start again. Otherwise, you're just not going to survive. It's the same with playing. You've got yeah. to get up and keep going. If you're not resilient as a footballer, you're not going to survive. If you're not resilient as a coach, um, you're not going to survive. Do you think there's any secret in there? Is it is it willpower? Is it just the, the preparedness to, to get up regardless? Oh, I think it's a personality thing. I mean, sometimes it's... I look at myself and say, am I punch drunk? Because I keep getting up and someone keeps, <laughs> keeps sticking one on the side of my head. It, um, but, it, I th- look, it, it helps. Some guys, you know, you know I've, I keep buying a lotto ticket, mate. And I, like, I'll win $1.36 or something like that. <laughs> Um, I've had a decent coaching job. I got a good payout from Sydney FC when I left, and Adelaide, the A League stuff was all right. Yeah. Um, some guys seem to lead a charm life in football, and it just the doors open. Yeah. Um, could be about the way they approach things. Um, other guys, it's a battle. It's, uh, I've been battling away for the last few years, but I enjoy the fight. But yeah. then maybe that's a reflection of my personality as well. The game was a battle for me as well. Yeah. It was about a war that, not a war that had to be won, but it was, you know, me against everybody else. Or our, team against them and we got to win yeah that's why that's why everyone wanted you in their team mate oh thank you <laughs> what have been uh, some of your most enjoyable moments as a coach Adelaide United definitely um, I'll go from A League I'll, and I'll go back to the start the, one of my first coaching job were Ringer Dolphins and I took a but, uh, I, look, it was in the state league and the, like the Premier League, as it was called back then in New South Wales, and there were some decent teams there. And we, um, I took a few players there that I'd known from um, my playing days at Sydney City, yeah. um, and a couple of guys that I'd seen around, and um, we actually got a really good bunch of guys together. And this is where I first worked out about the. Well, I always had this belief that um, if you've got a lot of team spirit, you've got a team that's close, you've got a good chance of being successful despite the football, whatever standard it's at, because your team spirit will get you through. Yeah. That's a big thing to fall back on. And a lot of, I read a lot of articles today about everyone's talking about, that's why everyone's talking about culture these days. It wasn't called culture back then, it was just a good team spirit. Yeah. It was what it was, everyone got on together. And even if you didn't, you walked out in that park and you had that, everyone got on together, everyone fought for each other. And we had that at the Dolphins. So I think first year we we got third. Next year we cleaned up. Yeah. 
And then I got a gig in the NSL with Newcastle and tried to do the same thing there. So I came bottom, second bottom, and bottom again. But luckily there was no relegation. Um, but once you got into the the NSL, it was the haves and the have-nots. Who's got money and who hasn't? Yeah. Um, and Newcastle being a regional area, um, it you know there wasn't it wasn't all that attractive to for players to go up there, and the money wasn't the same as what they could get in Sydney or Melbourne or. Um, even Brisbane, Brisbane were playing, paying good money back then. They had Frank Farina playing here and Rod Brown. And so I coached against players that I'd actually played with in the yeah. national team. Um, so that was a hard learning curve for me. And then I'll get to Adelaide United. When the, the A-League started, and I went down there for the last season of the NSL, and it came out of the blue, that job. I was living in Brisbane. I was actually on my way to Coffs Harbour. My wife's a childcare director, and we were actually going to buy a, a childcare centre. Right. and um, we were sorting out some finance and stuff like that, and the Adelaide United job came up. <laughs> and I thought, I can be a hippie in Coffs Harbour and um, walk around with no shoes on for the rest of my life, or um, I can have another crack at football. And I had to go back. I had to do it. Um, and it worked out all right because I've got a bunch of great players, mm. which is something we haven't touched on yet. You know, how much your, the quality of your squad helps. Yeah, uh, And I had... Guys like Ross Aloisi and Carl Viet and Aurelio Vidmar, um, that were that Ross had come back from overseas. Um, Aurelio had already been back for a couple of years. Um, Carl had been back a couple of years as well, um, and they were just really, really good footballers. They were experienced, and this is the thing about experienced players and the blend of youth. And so we went with virtually a whole Adelaide side and did really well in the NSL, and then we kicked into the A League. Um, NSL fell apart, A-League first season. We've literally won the premiership by yeah. seven or eight points with three or four games to go. Uh, we blew a gasket in the finals, probably because of um, that's where the youth, the inexperience of youth yeah. hurt us a little bit. But we were up there next year, copped that pacing off of you guys that uh, oh, I okay. still haven't watched yet. <laughs> and, um, you want I, me to watched, I can send you a link. No. <laughs> oh, I've, got a, I've got a CD here, a DVD. And I still won't watch it. But yeah. um, I've seen Archie's goals, though, because I work with him on Fox a bit, so I had to put up with it because he tells you about yeah, it all the time. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, yeah, but even then, you know, Adelaide United gave me a lot of joy because we, we won the premiership. The next year, we uh, we ended up coming second to you blokes. Um, the day I got sent off the bench for grabbing Muskie by the throat, that actually gave me a lot of joy as well. <laughs> that was when we beat you. First game you'd lost that season. Um so there was that Sydney FC was was hard. It was hard work. Yeah. It, um, first season when I first went there, it was good because I turned things around. Second season, um, culture at that club has been questionable. It was in the early part of the league, mm. and I think anybody um, that had been around there admitted that. Um, it took them a while to get things sorted. Now they've got a great culture they from the, do. In the club top to bottom, um, and that makes a difference. You get the club, and we. I know at Adelaide United, I used to talk about the family, which included the players, the, the staff, the supporters. We're all part of a, a big family. Um, and obviously, you know, some parts of it were off limits. The playing side of it for me, you know, the dressing rooms are off limits to, you know, outsiders and things like that. And um, I didn't really like people being at too many people being at training because it could be distracting and then rumours start to get out and things like that. But um, we were part of a family. Yeah. And that sort of thing is, is so important. Um, and I, I don't know if it's still, if they still think that way. Maybe they do, but we had that family feel at Adelaide. Yeah. Maybe we could do that because it was a, it's a smaller city. Yeah. Um, but it worked. It worked really well. You know, the first game of Adelaide United, 17,500 people at Hindmarsh. At the close of doors, there were three or 4,000 still outside. Yeah. It was an unbelievable night. And people still talk about it. It's only 17 years ago as well. It seems like there's another life. Yeah. Yeah. But then so did playing. <laughs> what a what a great football stadium uh, that that was. Because you touched on something there about people coming in the dressing room, and I just wonder whether you um, coaching changed because you know today it's a leadership role as as well as the players. You've got a, a range of different support staff, and and the more elite the competition, the more people you've got to lead and manage along the way. Um, there's also a part of leadership which is called managing up 
the, the people that don't report through to you, the CEO, maybe the football manager, the board, those sorts of things. Have you got have you got better at doing that over the journey, or is is that what you call politics, and you you're not really interested that's, in that? It's still what I call politics, although I do I understand it, but it frustrates the hell out of me because things go on in the dressing room that should just stay in the dressing room. Yeah. You know, it's what happens on tour, stays on tour type of thing. Yeah. Um, and you get too many different bodies coming in, including committee guys, um, especially committee guys that think they were rocket scientists at football and they weren't, um, or they aren't, and that's when the problems start. But if you don't let them in, then you've got a problem anyway. So, yeah. you know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So, no, I haven't got better at it. Um, I've probably... I've allowed it to happen a little bit more, but the lower you go down the like the, the levels, like in MPL, it's even worse. Yeah. Because it um, the NSL wasn't too bad. The A League was good, and I think the thing that we we'd set rules in place fairly early at Adelaide United. Certainly um, in the A League part of it, the NSL was only that one season, um, and it was all put together fairly quickly. So that. I let a lot of things slide there because it was it was working. Um, it's when if someone comes into a dressing room and then makes a negative comment about something that was happened in there afterwards, then you can put a gun to their head if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mate, I've never been a good upwards manager. <laughs> And you know what? I don't want to be, and I don't really care if I'm not. It doesn't make any difference to me. I'm, like you said, mate, 65 this year. Who gives a rest? Uh, I love it. Can't change it. T- tell us, let's use those 65 years of, of wisdom. What What are some of your, your best learnings over the journey? Um, probably learned a lot off my wife. It's like... Um, you know, I think before you, you speak, I fire from the hip. Well, I used to fire from the hip a hell of a lot. I'm a very reactive sort of person. Now, I've actually learned not to be reactive. I can take a, a backward seat, but that's there's a part of me that I recognize that that's how I am. That's part of my innate nature. Yeah. Um, I've probably needed to, to temper it a lot sooner than I have. I've learned my lessons late in life in that regard, um, but it's better late than never. And that would probably be the the main thing. It's like think, put yourself, put yourself in the other person's shoes. How would you feel if you were them? And the same thing was happening to me. Love it. You're listening to the Football Coaching Life podcast, brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media, the podcast professionals. And today's guest is John Cosmina. Cosy, we're on the the downhill run here, mate. Just a, a couple of questions to go. Um, I've got Arsenal 1978 on my page, and I was trying to work out how, how best to fit it in. You, you went at a very young age, um, I think transfer fee of £20,000, God only knows how much that would be in today's money, um, out of Australian football into the first division at one of the biggest clubs in Europe. Um, I'm just really wondering what that experience was like as a player, and just wonder whether there was any coaching or teaching or player education going on or it was just a matter of getting there and and give it the best and and hopefully it it works out well it was probably more of the latter um don howe was the coach you know the arsenal thing look i always said i've got no regrets about it you know it doesn't bother me but i actually have (laughs) i I wasted a great opportunity there but a lot of it had to do with probably a little bit of self-belief i I sort of done really well here it almost happened too quick um, and I was actually due to go to Tampa Bay Rowdies and, um, in the States. And that was in that old, whatever it was called back then. And that was party time from what I, <laughs> what I could work out. So I'm probably lucky that, <laughs> lucky that that didn't happen because I might not be talking to you now. Um, but no, the, the opportunity came up to go to Arsenal. And so I took it. Um, but I didn't really realize how big a club Arsenal was. There three, there were three football clubs in England at the time. Liverpool, Man U and Arsenal. Yeah. Now, they're still a, probably the only club that hasn't ever played in the second division. Been in the Division 1 for 100 years or yeah. more. Um, it was a massive club. And I probably didn't appreciate how big it was and I had no idea about what I needed to do to survive there. So, look, I did all right. 
Um, scored a lot of goals in the reserves in the first bit, came back, got some first team starts, went to a pre-season camp in Europe and I thought I'd done some hard work here in Australia but um, at pre-season we trained pretty much seven days a week for six weeks yeah. and I remember sitting in, I was in digs um, with a guy called Jimmy Harvey and um, lived in North London and had an old lady and her husband that used to look after us and I mean even that, the, the cultural change from Adelaide to to England was I'd been to England, but you know it wasn't like I'd stayed in hotels and stuff. It was zero room, not, but living in the street, you know, out in the in the suburbs, mate, so to speak, it was completely different. And um, you know, I left Adelaide; it was forty odd degrees and burning sunshine, and I got off of London twenty four hours later, and it was minus five and snowing. And um, that was it. Took me four weeks to thaw out once I got used to it. But yeah, but I remember sitting, getting back to the thing about being with Jimmy, I remember falling asleep in my dinner at home after training. We worked that hard. And um, I was, you know, but I'd never been as fit in my life. Yeah. But I'd probably, it's an opportunity I never really took enough advantage of. I should have stuck it out a bit longer. Um, but there wasn't a lot of coaching. Mm. Um, Don Howe, who was also the England coach at the time, was the first team coach. Terry Neal was the manager. And Terry didn't do much. Yeah. Uh, Don Howe did all the coaching, but he basically just organised patterns of play and that was it. And occasionally we would do an afternoon session where he'd teach you about what he wanted your, your movement patterns as a striker. And it was very, very simple. Four, four, two, up, back and through, which you'd know about. Yeah. Um, you know, it'd get knocked into your feet, you'd lay it off and someone else would play third man running. Yeah. Simple as that. Um I'd come from Australia where I've been pretty much allowed to do or develop how um, I'd wanted to. Yeah. Um, and I used to like a few touches. It's funny because I, I think back now and, and I think about Don Howe getting on my case about too many touches and I'm the same about I like players playing one, two touch now. <laughs> I don't mind the dribble when it's the right time to do it, if yeah. they can get away with it. But So not a well, lot's changed in 40 odd years, mate. But um, We used to do that a fair bit and I, it probably changed my game a little bit. Because um, I played with some unbelievable footballers. Mate, mm. Liam Brady was there. And for me, if he wasn't Irish, he'd be up there with Maradona and, and the others. You know, he'd come from you know, the Republic. Uh, he played for the Republic of Ireland. And, yeah. and they weren't recognised as a football power, but he was an unbelievable footballer. And the stuff he could do with the ball, and in five a size, you just couldn't get it off him. He was so yeah. clever. He played with Alan Hudson, um, who was at Chelsea before that. He was a rat bag. He's from that old rat pack, you know. Like, and, you know, the first thing that those older guys could do, they straight after training, they'd be in the pub, yeah. whether it was in the morning that was or the, the culture. Afternoon. Yeah, it was part of the culture. It was a massive drinking culture in the English football at the time. Uh, but the stuff Alan Hudson could do with the ball, they were just really, really good footballers. Um, and look, I had a few games there, but I should have stuck it out. But, you know, probably it was a tough one because. If you go to Arsenal, mate, where else do you go after that apart yeah. from down? Yeah. Hey, you ca- you came home and had a remarkable career, Cosy. Um, it was uh, all that fitness work put you in in great stead. Remarkable career at, at Sydney City with some some wonderful players. And but we're not going to talk any more about your playing stuff. That was just me being nosy. Two more questions to go. As a coach, what does success look like? It's a, I mean, you can talk about it and simplify it and just say winning. But for me, it, it's more than that because I think you've got to I look at it now, especially when I'm working with a lot of younger players. Um, it's about, for me, success as a coach is, is working on something on the park and then seeing it happen on the training paddock and then seeing it happen in the game on the weekend and seeing it work. And that's, for me, is success. Now, to win games, you need to do that a lot of times in a game. Yeah. Um, and so it's getting players to, to buy into to the way that you think. Um, that can be success because if they start to implement your beliefs and they believe in you, you believe in them, and you get results, then that's been successful as well. I mean, you don't have to win to be a successful coach. There's a lot of great coaches that have, have never won anything. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been fortunate that, you know, I, I won a premiership. I was happy with that. Um, you know, I, I look at even that grand final that you smacked us in, the fact that we got there Absolutely. that season for me was a success because we we were cruising until Romario came to Adelaide United that season. 
Um, and you talk about man management, there I wasn't real good then. <laughs> and my managing up was abysmal at that time because um, I didn't want him. Um, but he he killed all the momentum, and it took us. It was a real battle to get even to get to that grand final. Yeah. Um, so I looked at that season as much as we lost that grand final. It was a successful season for us because you made the grand final. That's got to be part of the success. You don't have to win to be successful. But part of it, it's all part of the journey. Winning's mm. the, the icing on the cake. But you can't have any icing without a cake to put it on, can you? <laughs> All right. We're going to keep this last question. We're going to keep that wisdom rolling now. So if you've got one piece of wisdom for young coach, middle of the road coach, coach on the towards the back end of the journey, what would one piece of wisdom to a coach today to be? One piece of wisdom. It's a tough one. Put yourself in the player's shoes. And I mentioned that before. That'll do me. Put yourself in the player's shoes. John Cosmina, it's been, a, an on- <laughs> it's been an honour and pleasure, mate. It's been really great to have you on, and um, I'm sure people are going to love listening to your coaching journey. Thanks, guys. It's been great talking to you. Cheers, mate. You've been listening to The Football Coaching Life, a podcast brought to you by Football Coaches Australia and Making Media the Podcast People. If you've enjoyed today's uh, chat with John Cosmina, if you'd like to find out more about Football Coaches Australia, renew your membership, buy a new membership, please visit footballcoaches.org, sorry, footballcoachesoz.org.au. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.